Hi all, this is, uh, I almost said Coach Stacy. Uh, Stacy Everett's Professional Development Engagement Manager. Uh, Jeffrey and I will be training you on conscious discipline. And so we had a lot of conscious discipline last year, those of you who are here on some Saturdays, and we've had some layered conscious discipline through this year. Um, I'm excited that there's some packs of stuff that are going out to your classrooms. Um, and so facilities is delivering those. So you'll have the stuff to make the books that Jeffrey's gonna do with you later in the training. Uh, three more books for your classroom. So we're excited about that. Um, and so uh, we're excited to see how you guys are, are using conscious discipline this year in the rooms and how it's helping our students, especially um, with all the trauma uh, that our students and families and ourselves are experiencing right now and, and through COVID and, and just the complexities of, of life that are happening now. So let me open up um, the PowerPoint here so that you can see the screen. Um, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the theory piece, and then Jeffrey will do the fun part at the end with the hands-on. And so, uh, the skill that we're gonna talk about for this chunk of conscious discipline is assertiveness. And so, assertiveness is the skill the grown-up needs, the parent needs, the teacher needs, the the partner, the manager needs um, to teach a child or someone else. Uh, their part, which is um, respect. And so if I am working in the classroom and I feel like students are disrespectful, one of the skills that I need to work on is my own assertiveness. Now, I feel like assertiveness is a really weighted word. And sometimes in today's society, the connotation can be different for different people, um, especially for women. Um, but assertiveness means in this context, setting limits respectfully. And so when I'm a teacher, I'm gonna set limits respectively to keep uh, the children in my care safe. So setting limits, making rules from the classroom is about keeping uh, children safe. So why do I make my child hold my hand across the parking lot to keep them safe? Um, why do we walk in the classroom? To, um, to keep us safe? Uh, why do we have to sit while using scissors to keep us safe? And so what kinds of boundaries are we setting? Um, these kinds of things uh, allow us to have healthy relationships. So having those healthy boundaries, whether you're an FSW or a teacher or any kind of grown up in a relationship with someone, um, those boundaries uh, are important so that we all feel respected, so that all of our needs are taken care of. And so, and we're gonna practice some different things that we can try, because I'm that may sound hard. Um, so think about this power of attention. And so when you look at, there's a lot of research around this, and if you've read through Becky Spaley's book, uh, she gave us that one free in the one training. Um, there's a whole chunk that talks about what you offer to others you experience in yourself. So what I give out externally, I get back to myself internally. So if I'm offering a lot of criticism to my students, to my coworkers, to the people I manage, then you're gonna feel a lot of criticism within yourself. So it's that whole what you're putting out is what you're getting back. So if I'm conversely offering people grace or patience, then you're gonna feel more of that internally with yourself. So the more you micromanage others, the more you're gonna do that to your yourself internally. Uh, the tighter you get um, with that thing you're doing out to other people, you're going to feel that back um, again inside yourself. Um, if you focus on what somebody else is doing wrong, it's going to make you feel inadequate. And so I can send you research if you want to read more about it. It's really interesting. But if you focus on what someone else is doing wrong, so if you're looking at this person doing this wrong and that wrong and this wrong, it's gonna to start to make yourself feel inadequate. Um, but if you focus instead on what someone did well, what are the students in your room doing well? What are the people you supervise doing well? Uh, what is your spouse doing well? Uh, that helps you feel at peace inside. And so if you're building it up, if you're building other people up, if you're building those pieces, that's going to help you with your internal landscape. And there's a really good book actually called Internal Landscape. Uh, you can get it for free on Libby um, that talks more about that. All right. So in the classroom or, or if you have children um, in your life, whether whether you're a grandma uh, like me um, or, or a parent, um, you can try this method of, of show and tell and show. 
And so it's all about modeling. So if you think of teacher practices, this would go under modeling. And as you listen to this, put your little class brain on uh, teachers and think about how many of these things are behavioral markers within class that you can give yourself credit for. All right, so if we're trying to have a student, if we're setting a boundary, if we're setting a limit, <clears throat> we're gonna give an assertive command. And so not a wishy-washy. So wishy-washy would be like, be like, it's time to clean up, okay? Okay feels wishy-washy, like you're giving a choice. And so it's time to clean up. So you're gonna give an assertive command. If the child complies, praise him. You gotta do that immediately. The quicker praise happens after the action, the more impact that it has. And so um, if a child puts away the Legos, oh, thank you for cleaning up the Legos. Um, wait, if they don't comply, make sure you first get their attention. And so Growing Great Kids has this, my home visitors use Growing Great Kids cur curriculum, and they have this really great thing called getting in sync. And so you're waiting for the child's attention. Um, have you ever tried to talk to someone who's reading a book or playing a game or on their phone and you feel like they're not even listening to you? It's because that you guys haven't synced up, you haven't gotten that attention. And so Becky Bailey will point to her chin when she's doing it uh, in modeling. I've seen teachers like touch their nose and the child's nose to kind of get them to connect in. Uh, maybe don't touch noses right now during COVID. Um, but when they make eye contact, you say, there you are. So you get their attention. There you are. In classrooms, sometimes we do this. We have um, lights that we turn down to get that attention focused in. Uh, we turn music down or music on to get attention. Or maybe we ring a bell. But all those things are those attention cues so that you're, you're pulling in. So when you get their attention, so before you're repeating a command, I'm not just going to say my command out in the nothingness. Um, if, if I'm reading a book, I get so focused in, my children will say, um, we were talking to you and you didn't even hear us because I was so focused in on my novel that I couldn't hear them. So they needed to first get my attention. Uh, my son um, that lives at home wears his earbuds all the time. And I'll talk to him and realize that he didn't even hear me because his earbuds were in. So I got to give him a little tap on the shoulder. He pulls his earbud out. And then, then I say again the thing that I wanted. So once you get that attention, that gotten in sync part, you're going to repeat the command. It's time to clean up. If they don't know how to do it still, then we're going to say, I'm going to show you what I want you to do. I think sometimes cleanup is so hard because children are so overwhelmed with all the things that are out that they don't know how to clean up. And so I'm going to say, okay, we're going to put the fruit and the food in the kitchen area, in the refrigerator. We're gonna put the dishes in the sink. Uh, where should we put the baby? We should put the baby in the cradle and then we're gonna hang the clothes up in the closet. So I'm gonna model, I'm gonna physically do these things myself and I'm gonna show them how I want them to do it. Um, or I'm gonna say, I'm gonna show you how to get started. So I'm gonna put the first two pieces of food in the refrigerator and the bromatic play so that they can do it. Or sometimes you can ask, how can I help you get started? And so um, maybe, it, maybe at home you're, you're like, uh, here's where we keep the trash bags and here's the full trash. We're gonna pull that up out, we're gonna tie a knot in it. And then, so you're gonna scaffold. So think about that Vygotsky theory, we're gonna scaffold their success. Another trick for cleanup, two different tricks for cleanup. One, if they're having a hard time putting everything away, you may have too much stuff out. So you may need to put less stuff out so they can put that away well and then get more out. You might try taking a picture of what the area looks like clean uh, or put away the way you want it. And that way children can see what the expectation is. That's very helpful. Especially if you take pictures of the children doing the cleanup and showing them. Uh, it's helpful sometimes to have a helper job uh, that checks to make sure everything is cleaned up, especially for that child who really needs everything to be precise. Um, and then, hmm, there was a fourth one I was gonna tell you that's escaped my brain. Um, visual cues, oh well. You have to have another training with me and we'll come up with that one. All right, so um, we talk about getting your focus. And so think about this, have you ever gotten a new car?
and then you walk out of the mall or the grocery store and you can't find your car because all you can see is the same kind that you have. So I buy a white van. I look out in the parking lot. Suddenly I see 17 white vans. Um, I'm looking for a blue Honda Civic. I look out. Suddenly there are all these blue cars, which I never noticed before because you see what you're focusing on. And so if I'm looking for white vans, I see white vans. Um, anybody play like the slug bug game when you're driving? And so every time you see a Volkswagen bug, maybe you do the slug bug game. And so what you're focusing on, you see more of. Now what that happens, what happens in our relationship is that if we pay attention to what we focus on, what you focus on, you see more of. And so do I wanna focus on disrespect in the classroom or do I wanna focus on pro-social behaviors like smiling, cleaning up, sharing, uh, physical affection? So what am I focusing on? Because whatever I'm focusing on, I'm gonna get more of that thing. So think about what that looks like um, in a peer relationship with a relationship with another grown up or with someone you supervise. And so the thing that I'm focusing on, I'm gonna get more of. So think about what you want. I think the next slide says it. Oh, it's maybe the slide after that, but there's another way we're going to talk about it. Um, whenever I see the word pivot, I think of I think of the uh, coach Jen. Uh, coach Jen and I always laugh about that that one episode from um, from Friends. And so we're going to pivot when we're upset. If you've been in a training with Becky Bailey, she'll take her hand and actually physically shift. Because sometimes when you pivot, you need to physically remove your body from a place or from a person uh, so you can calm down. So sometimes you have to remove yourself from a space or an activity and pivot, and then you can come back. Hard to calm down when you're still in the middle of the thing that's, that's causing you upset. And so here are some strategies to try. Uh, say to yourself, okay, I'm upset. And so it happens. I'll say, I'm not gonna let Columbus, I'm not gonna let the way people drive um, upset me. But then suddenly I'm merging from 270 to 70 and people forget how to merge. And I have to say to myself, okay, I'm upset. So if I'm upset, I'm focusing on what I don't want. What I don't want is idiot drivers that don't take turns when they merge in and out. Do I want more of that in my life? Do I want more of these drivers that are frustrating me? No. If the answer is no, then I first have to get myself together. So I'm going to take some deep breaths. Now, remember, you're going to go in through your nose and out through your mouth. Make sure you're holding those each for at least three seconds. Better to do it longer. And you have to do it at least three times. So try it with me. In through your nose. Out through your mouth. In through your nose. Out through your mouth. I'm gonna do it one more time. In through my nose. Out through my mouth. I don't know you, but you, but I, that makes me feel calmer already. There's a lot of reasons for that. If you want to look at the research behind it, uh, our body, when we get stressed, goes into fight or flight. Our heart rate goes up, our eyes dilate, um, our stomachs get upset, we might get goosebumps or sweaty. And so it has all these physical things that happen. But by taking those deep breaths, you're reducing the amount of that chemical that's that's in your brain, uh, which can actually do toxic damage. So if we have that fight or flight all the time going on, that releases that chemical over and over and over in our brain, it can actually reduce our IQ. It can actually damage our brain. Think about how scary that is, that if you're living your life constantly angry and mad and upset, uh, which is what half of Facebook feels like right now, you can get caught up in all that anger, anger, anger. It can actually be doing damage to your brain. And so so work on these ways to kind of relax and pivot when you're feeling upset. And so we're going to take those deep breaths. We're going to get more oxygen into our body, more oxygen into our brain. We're going to try to move ourselves down from that brainstem up into our frontal cortex so where that abstract thinking can happen. And then we're going to pivot so we can do this physically or mentally. Um, and then you're going to tell the child specifically and firmly what to do. Because what happens instead, you ask them as a parent, they don't do it. You ask them again. They don't do it. You ask them again. They don't do it. And then eventually you're screaming and you've, you're that insane mom who's completely lost your sanity, hoping the neighbors you don't hear is you just completely lost your mind about some Legos on the floor. Um, if a why is needed, relate the command to safety. So remember, we're going to take it all back to safety. Why do I want you home at this time? 
um, because the roads are getting dangerous because it was snowing. Uh, why do I need you to come back from lunch on time so that your coworker can take their lunch and can have a safe amount of time to get there back and eat uh, before they have to start to work? So relate it back to safety. Um, for us, if we're out of ratio, it's a huge safety problem. All right, remember, um, Becky Bailey really advocates all of those deep breathing things uh, and affirmations. Um, I love, love, loved uh, my group over um, that I used to have over at Avalon had daily affirmations they did with the children and they were wonderful to watch the children do. Um, if you read research, they'll talk about standing with your hands on your hips doing the Superman pose can increase uh, self-esteem and it can increase feelings of self-control and self-worth. And um, doctors are doing this now, doctors, nurses, medical staff, they're standing before surgery and taking some deep breaths during the Superman pose together. Um, so it really does, these little things can help build us up. Um, so think about what you might want an affirmation to be, and you're going to have to do that at least three times a day. So we're going to do these little things three times, they're going to repeat, and they're going to help us um, get our mental health and get our insides internally where we are so that we can help others. If we're upset, it's really hard to help somebody else who's upset. We have to be calm and download our calm into that person. And so maybe I'm going to choose this for my principle that I'm going to try for the next couple of days. Um, what I focus on, I get more of. If I focus on drinking water, I'm going to drink more water. What I focus on, I'm going to get more of. If I'm patient with other people, I'll get more grace in return. When I'm upset, I always focus on what I don't want. When I'm upset, I always focus on what I don't want. When I'm upset, I always focus on the thing I don't want. So think about the different mantra you could have, the different affirmations you can try. You can do them with your students in the classroom. Uh, you can do them in a huddle with your teaching group before you teach. So sometimes I think we're so busy, 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 busy to start our day that taking time as a team to kind of breathe together. My group did this over um, at Dahlberg and it really helped them. It really helped them. That afternoon class was a really hard one behavior-wise one year and doing, having a little time where they all just did some breathing together. and they, they were just like, I can handle this. I'm a good teacher. I can handle this. I know what I'm doing. I'm skilled. I can handle this. And so pick what works for you. Um, I know that it sounds hippy dippy, but it really does work. All right. So conflict solution, conflicts, conflict situations. Uh, we never have this in classrooms, right? Uh, just all the time. And so you have two children. One child goes over, knocks over the other child's blocks. So I'm always, always, always. First, I'm going to make sure the situation is safe so that they're not continuing to hit and fight and scratch and bite. First, I'm going to get the situation safe and get them separate. Then ideally, you have one person for the victim and one person for the aggressor. But, but life is not always that way. So I'm going to position my body between the two and I'm going to go to the victim first. Always, always, always going to take care of the victim first. And so because that shows them they're what's important. Taking care of their needs is what's important. They're the one who got hurt. So they're who we should be uh, taking care of first. And so I'm going to help them. I'm going to get their body safe. I'm going to take care of their physical needs. I'm going to help them regulate. I'm going to breathe with them. And then when they're ready, which is not going to happen in a minute, it's going to take a little bit of time. I need to take them to the person that hurt them or the person that, that engaged in that aggressive behavior. And I'm going to help them with the words. So I'm over here with, with the child who got hurt. And over here is the child who, you know, smacked them. And so I'm going to say to this child, did you like that when he hit you? And I'm going to say, I didn't like that. I'm going to say, I need you to tell him you didn't like it. Say, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. And so then you're going to say, did that hurt your arm when he hit you? Yeah, that hurt. Tell him that hurt my arm. And so then the child say, that hurt my arm. Um, this is like the worst puppet show ever, I just realized. So uh, please, please don't laugh too hard. Um, and then you're going to say, this is the hardest part. What do you want them to do instead? So what do you want him to do instead? I want him to use a gentle touch. I want him to give me a hug. I want him not to play with me. I mean, these are all valid choices. And so coming up with that what 
you want them to do, children are going to need help with that. We're grown adults and we can't always tell. I can tell you what I don't want somebody to do, but it's harder to tell them what I want them to do. I want them to just give me some space and leave me alone. I want them to pick up after themselves. I want them to use their words. I want them uh, to play with their own square magnet tiles. And so that's going to take some skill. Uh, if you are an infant toddler teacher, you're always going to have to help them with that why. They're not going to be ready yet for what to do instead. You're going to have to really help them with it. If you want help with that part, um, go back to uh, that Vanderbilt website and look at that solution kit. Or I think there's a I think there's something on our YouTube channel about the solution kit. So check out the little chunk about how to use a solution kit. There are eight solutions that work in a classroom when you have conflict. Um, and there are little cards you can make and use with students and it's a really good strategy. Uh, use I messages. So be careful not to say um, you, you make me angry, you make me this, you did that. And instead of say flip it and use those I messages. I feel, I need. So use those I messages instead. All right. And so you are now are into the part of the training that's with Miss Jeffrey. Um, if we were in person, we would have done the lovely brain breaks where we get up and move. Um, but since it's virtual, we had to pivot a little. There's that word again, pivot. We had to pivot. And so uh, I wish you well. Hello, um, I'm Jeffrey Self. I'm education coach um, for partnerships. And I'm going to take you through the second part of our training today, and that is about classroom books. Um, so this is your make it, take it portion. So um, you may or may not have already received materials. Um, if you don't have materials already, they are coming. Um, and these materials um, will be used to create um, classroom books for your um, specific classrooms. Um, in order to receive your one and a half hours of Ohio approved um, credit for this training, all you need to do is once you um, finish watching, um, email me your name, your open, and the topic that you're going to use um, for creating your first classroom book. Um, once you do create your classroom books, we would love pictures of them, but it is not required um, in order to receive credit. Just please send us your name, your open, and the topic that you're going to use. Um, and then whenever you have time, please send us pictures of those books just so we can see um, the cool things that you've created and also share um, with other teachers um, and, and partnership teachers as well. We like to you know, let everybody um, share in all of the cool ideas that we have as an agency. Um, it helps, um, it helps you know, make us even better. Um, when we share our ideas. So um, I'm going to talk about classroom books. Um, these differ from books that you might get from the library and that you are specifically creating them based off the children's interests. Um, it's an amazing resource that we can go to the library and get books that um, coincide or are similar to the topic that we're studying. Um, but with classroom books, we're creating them specifically. We're catering them um, specifically um, to what our children are interested in. So it's a really nice way of um, being able to get very specific and make sure that we're really, um, you know, that the children are getting to see things that are really based off of what they're interested in and what they're talking about. Um, so we're going to talk about all the different ways that you can create books. We're going to talk about um, why they're um, great classroom tools and um, here we go. All right, so um, the first thing that's amazing about classroom books is that you can use them to extend ideas. So say that you've already, um, you're, you've you know, been talking about big cats for weeks. The children are super interested in talking about big cats. Um, you've been doing some investigations, you've been researching all the different places that big cats live, um, but now you even wanna extend it further. So. A classroom book on big cats could be as simple as going online and printing out pictures of the different big cats for the children to just, you know, look through. That is a classroom book, is pictures of big cats. Um, but if you wanted to take it even further, get a little more in depth, 
you might add words to your pages. So you might print out some pictures of um, this example up in the top corner. Um, it's showing the tiger running and then above it says this cat runs. So very simple. Um, it's something that the child could page through and they could be describing the picture. And that's basically what the words are saying. So a child might say the tiger is running. Um, and then you can show them that the words say this cat runs. So it's a very you know basic, simple beginning reading tool. Um, if you wanna even get a little bit more in depth, you might add an interactive piece to it. Um, down at the bottom, it shows um, a sorting activity that you could add to your book. So there's little Velcro pieces where the children could sort which ones are domestic cats versus which ones are wild cats. So um, then we're extending that into a sorting activity. We're also even getting some fine motor skill work in with doing the little pieces in the Velcro. Um, uh, and then if you wanted to extend it further, you might add an I spy or some sort of um, matching game into your classroom book. This is just showing all of the different types of prints that a big cat might have. So you've got spots and stripes um, and different variations. So that might be something else you add in your classroom book is um, trying to match and guess and hypothesize what big cat this fur belongs to. So it's just, you're really just taking the topic they're already interested in and then dividing it up and honing in on little individual pieces of it so you can extend it even further. So you're just investigating it even more. Um, the next way that um, classroom books can be made are interactive. So we already kind of had some interactive pieces in our big cat book that we talked about, um, but you can take it even further. So um, sensory is something that we all know that it's really good with helping with self-regulation. It's a really just good, like engaging piece um, of the children's day. So if we can add um, sensory into anything, it's going to make it more engaging. So this first example is a touch and feel book. So in this book, they've just glued down various types of textures. So you might use sandpaper, netting, you could put feathers, faux fur, sponge, any sort of thing that has like a nice, um, interesting uh, feel to it into the book. So as the children page through, they can feel those different um, textures. And um, it could be something that is, is soothing or it could be something that if you wanted to, you know, have a conversation about, you could do that too. Um, this next example is based off of Pete the Cat. I love my school shoes. so. Um, in this book, the teachers just taken pictures of all of the children's different shoes and then put it into a book. So as they page through, they can see and guess whose shoes they are. So it's just a nice way of making a little personal connection. Um, and also, um, it's something that they can interact with. Um, this last example is Match the Shapes. So in this book, um, the teacher has printed out a page that has um, various silhouettes of shapes. And then there are also pieces that go along with the book that they can then match it to. So they can try to find the piece that um, corresponds with the shape. You could do this with shapes, you could do it with letters, numbers, you could do it with anything. Um, so this is a little bit more of an academic classroom book um, that the child can interact with. Um, next, so classroom books are an amazing way to make personal connections with your children. Um, so a classroom book can be making a personal connection with a specific child, or it's something that you could make as a classroom, and that will help build your classroom community and your school family if your books are connecting with the whole room. Um, so in this first example, it's a classroom family book. So um, the children are able to illustrate their families. And then you could have like the words in this one are there are blank people in my family. So then the child can count how many people are in their family and have that as their page. Um, and that book would have all of the children's families in it for them to look at. Um, the second book is another nice one, Who's Smile? So the teacher has taken pictures of all the children's little smiling faces. And that's a um, nice way they can flip through and try to guess whose smile it is. Um, and then this last one is an example of a school family book where the parents um, have um, given pictures 
of themselves. And then the teacher has created a page for each family member. So this is something that maybe each child in the classroom would have one of these. Um, and I imagine this could be something like before nap time, it might be a nice routine where everybody can go get their family book and look at it on their cot while they get ready to rest. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, all of these are um, amazing ways of connecting with the children because it's really about them. Um, I also love in the um, this first example where the children have done their own illustrations. So classroom books don't have to be that you've gone online and searched through Google for ever trying to find the exact right images. Um, you can put the kids to work, have them illustrate the book, and um, that's going to be even more meaningful to them because they're going to see that their work is in this book, that their work is valued, and that other children can look at it um, and they can connect with each other by seeing their um, very own artwork in the book. Um, classroom books can be fiction or nonfiction. So most of the things that we've talked about so far would be classified as nonfiction. So if we're doing like a skills book or if we're talking about our families or our lives, that's going to be things that really happened. Now, you could also do fiction. So that would be making up your own stories. Um, as a classroom, you could make up a story. Um, you could tweak a version of a well-known story like Three Little Pigs. Um, add in each child can, you know, add in their own page of what they think might have happened. So there's lots of ways that you can invent stories um, and make um, a fictional story that also can be a classroom book. And a fictional story would be an ideal place where the children would get to illustrate their own page. So um, not only are you, um, you know, using that, those cognitive skills to kind of invent a story and, and think of something, but also um, you're really um, inviting that creativity um, with, you know, creating some sort of visual art or drawing that um, would be the illustration for the story. This other book is just another example of, um, which would be considered nonfiction, like a feelings book. So the teacher has taken pictures of the children of the classroom um, doing their facial expression of their interpretation of that feeling. Um, so it's just another nice way of making connections. Sometimes when we talk about emotions, um, it can be kind of abstract, but if we are seeing actual pictures of our friends' faces in a book, um, it's gonna help us to connect to that emotion even more. All right, so a lot of the books that we've looked at are things that the teachers have created um, with their own two hands. They've gotten online, they found pictures, or they've taken photographs and then printed them out and then compiled them, which is, amazing. It's probably the best way to do a classroom book um, because it has, you know, a little more um, emotion to it. But another way to do it is digitally. Um, Canva is a cool site. We've been using it a lot to make um, like slideshows, to make flyers for certain things. It's just a very nice, um, easy to use site that can kind of help with formatting and making things look nice and professional. So, um, if cutting out and gluing isn't your thing, this might be a nice way for you to make a classroom book um, digitally. So um, the website is there, um, www.canva.com, and there is a free version, which is all that I use, and frankly, it's all that I think is necessary. Um, there is a paid version, but it just offers, you know, some additional um, images and some, some different um, things, but I think the free version is just fine. So um, the cool thing about Canva is, is that you're able to still use and upload all of your own photos if you want, but it does offer um, lots of images within itself that you can use. Um, and you can create a book that's just online. So it's something that you would, um, the children could look at with a tablet or on a computer. It's something that you could email to families. Um, you can also save it as a PDF and then print it out. So it's, you can do both things. You can have a digital book or you can print it out um, as well. So we're gonna um, talk a little bit more about digital books here. And we're gonna start with this tutorial. So um, this tutorial shows how to make a classroom book 
um, on Canva. This, um, the lady who's talking, she does go through it really fast. So don't feel like this is going to be, this is going to teach you how to do it all in this six minute video. You're going to have to go on and, really, um, you know, just play around with it and experiment with it to get acclimated to it. But this is a very nice, quick version. She shows you basically all the steps to get started. And then she shows you some other little um, things too that will help, you know, jazz up your classroom books. Um, I do want to say beforehand though, she does mention using Canva to make worksheets. So I just want, when you hear that word worksheet, you know, just plug your ears, you know, do your earmuffs because we don't do worksheets in um, the Head Start classrooms. It's not developmentally appropriate. So just when you hear her say that, just pretend like it never happened. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and play the video and hopefully you find it helpful. Hi, I'm Jamie from ESL Teacher 365. In this Canva tutorial for teachers, I'll show you how easy it is to create a children's book on Canva for online or in-person teaching. Let's get started. First, click on Create Design, and then I'm doing the presentation. I'm gonna search for a photo to use as my background. So I typed in under the sea. You can select and drag the photo you want to use. So you'll notice that I have the pro version, so I have the pro and free photos available. If you'd like to get access to thousands of templates and millions of photos, clip art, and videos, then check out my link down below to try Canva Pro for one month for free. Now I'm going to start to create a title for my book. So I use the elements and type in rectangle. You can drag the sides to resize it. And then click on these squares to choose colors. I'm going to use the text tool to create the title of the book. I'm going to resize the font up here. You can also use the plus and minus buttons. And you do have these faint lines that help you center images and text. I'm just going to highlight it and then change the font so it's a bit easier to read. So you can import fonts. I've imported this one from Creative Market, but Canva has a ton of fonts that you can use as well. So if you click on the font, you can also click on effects and you'll have a few different options. Again, wherever you see a square, that means that you can change the color. And here I'm changing the color of the actual font. Now I wanna use some different images in my background and I'll show you how you can put this behind your title. So I can click and drag and make it big. Then you're going to right click and you can send backwards. So step-by-step step, sending it behind my title. So now I have this nice title page to duplicate. I just press this button up here. And I like to do this because then it already has the same background. I can just get rid of whatever I don't want to use. So you can click and drag and then that will allow you to resize the whole thing as a unit instead of just the font or the image separately. So now I'm going to search for a question mark. So you can try it out, see what it looks like. I don't really like this one. Lots of options. I think I'll go with this one. Again, duplicate the page. And this is going to be for my first character. So I see a sea turtle looking at me. And then you can easily just get rid of that by deleting it and put in a nice little sea turtle. So there's a ton of great clip art. And you can also find a lot of black and white stuff, which is great when you're trying to make a worksheet or if you want to make a printable book. So just putting in some seaweed to decorate a little bit, adding a little more. And I'll show you how you can flip this. So on the other side, I'm gonna flip this just by clicking flip and you can do horizontal or vertical. So here's the animate feature, which is really cool if you're using this as an animated book. There's a lot of different options that you can use. Just play around and see how it looks. So you can do a PDF version of this book. You can show it on a screen. You can send it as a link. There's so many different options. You can even make it into a little video, whatever you'd like to do. So now I'm just working on the next bit. I want a different question mark. So same thing, go to elements, search for question mark. And I've just duplicated this and then you can slide it down. 
just so you don't have to redo the titles and everything every time. This time I see a dolphin swimming past me. So you'll see it's a bit too big. So you can always click and drag it, change the size, whatever you need to do. It's pretty easy. So now I'm gonna change up my background, different photo, and then I can match this with my question slide. And obviously we need a dolphin now. And sometimes it like replaces the background photo. So you just need to take your time and then it will realize it wants to use it as an image and not the backgrounds. Resize. And I'm gonna spice this one up with some bubbles. I want to show you how you can get animated things. So if you click on this, you can type in animated or select animated. And then you do have for some images, you have the option of animated, which just is even better if you're doing a story, grabs the attention. I can even do some animated bubbles. It doesn't have everything in animated, but it does have enough stuff. Let's take a look at how the book turned out. You can present in Canva and it will go through all the little animation. I'm choosing when to turn the page so you can have the kids read it or you can read it, repeat, whatever you want to do. But just to show you what it looks like when it's animated. And of course you can have a static one as well. I hope you enjoyed today's Canva tutorial for teachers on how to make a children's book. If you'd like to learn all right i hope you found that helpful um so i think that's just a great example of how very quickly she was able to put together um a very cute classroom book um so if um hopefully this is something that you guys um, will use um and have fun with whoops all right so that concludes um, our classroom book training today. Um, please, please don't forget, after you watch this, um, email me with your name, your open, and the topic that you're going to use um, to create your classroom book, and that I'll make sure that you get your one and a half hours of credit for this training. Um, then later, once, you're, once you have time and you're able to make a classroom book, please send us pictures because we really want to um, be able to um, check out all the cool stuff you're doing and also share these pictures um, with our agency and with our partners um, in order to, you know, just create um, a nice community environment where we're all kind of sharing ideas and inspiring each other. Um, so our email is here. Um, you can email me, Jeffrey South, um, in order to get your credit. I'll make sure that you get your credit. Please, please watch this. Please, please make sure that you've completed this training by February 4th. We'll make sure we include that in the email and that way we can get your credit um, and then create your classroom books when you have time. Um, the resources that we use today, we use Conscious Discipline. Um, ConsciousDiscipline.com is an awesome website. There's tons of resources on there, a lot of free stuff, um, a lot of good um, information in the frequently asked questions. So um, make sure you use that um, as a resource. And then of course, Canva.com um, was the resource that we talked about for making those digital books. Um, thank you so much for watching. I know that it's asking a lot having you guys come out of the classroom and take time to do these trainings, but um, we really hope that you're enjoying them and we hope that um, you're finding the information helpful. Um, please email me if you have any questions, if you need help with, you know, classroom books or if you need have questions about Canva, um, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to help. Um, thank you so much and have a good rest of your day.